Welcome back to the Castlevania Marathon, where I'll be taking a look at the first four Castlevanias all throughout October. Last week, I took a look at Castlevania and how it instantly became a classic due to its original take on the platforming genre. The graphics, theme, music, and gameplay really made this platformer stand out from the rest. And although it can be difficult at times and the knockback can be too much and the platforming physics haven't aged very well, it's still a well-made classic NES game that I personally really enjoyed. So back in the 80s, some companies didn't really know how to treat their sequels right. They treated them more as experiments rather than expansions from the original. Just look at Zelda 2 and Super Mario Bros. 2. Zelda 2 took Zelda 1's core gameplay, which was adventure and exploration, but put it in a 2D environment instead of a top-down view. Super Mario Bros. 2 changed the whole jumping on enemies and grabbing mushroom style, and instead focused on a holding and throwing mechanic. What most of these sequels have in common is it keeps the original theme of the game, but switches the gameplay or sometimes even the whole genre from the original. They also learn from their mistakes when they experiment too much, cause in the third entry in most of these series, they go back to the original game's format and expand upon it in a bigger and better way. Not only did Nintendo use their sequels as experiments, but Konami experimented with one of the franchises in particular. And come on guys, you already know, it starts with a C. Yep. It's Contra. Castlevania 2 really strayed away from the original. Like most of these sequels, it kept the same theme, you're still whipping monsters and having to fight Dracula, but instead of the linear level-based design of the first one, Konami decided to go for a more adventure slash Zelda 2 format, which sounds cool on paper. Simon's Quest, exploring all over Castlevania, finding secrets, using items, fighting cool new monsters. It sounds cool, but is it executed well? Is it designed good? Is it as hard as the original? I don't know. I haven't played it, so let's take a look at this experimented sequel, Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. Because of how much of a success Castlevania was on the NES, of course Konami wanted to make a sequel, and that sequel is what we know today as Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. It gained positive reception when it first released and was ranked the 15th best NES game on the system, but as time went on, I've noticed more and more people have started to dislike the game, most notably AVGN. But I never got around to playing this one, it never really interested me probably because of the hate it was getting. I wanted to try it someday, but I never had the motivation to play it. Until now, I got a marathon to go through, so here we go. The story takes place seven years after the battle against Dracula. After Home Run smacking Dracula's head off and defeating him once and for all, his body parts were somehow spread all over Castlevania, uh, Transylvania, I don't know where this takes place. Apparently during the fight, Dracula put a curse on Belmont, and as time went on, he sensed that something was wrong with him. Because of the curse, Belmont didn't have much time to live, and the only way to undo the curse is to kill Dracula again. So it's your job to retrieve all five parts of Dracula's body, resurrect him, and defeat him once again. First, you'll notice when you start the game, you're in a town with NPCs. That should be more than enough indication that this isn't just your good old hack and slash Castlevania. Simon's Quest is a non-linear adventure slash RPG slash kind of like Zelda 2, but not really. Instead of the linear level-based design of the first game, Simon's Quest departs from the original format of Castlevania and goes for the longer adventure and exploration type game. But that doesn't mean it took out everything the original had to offer. Both good and bad. You still got that classic whip as your main source of attack, you still have those spooky ghouls and ghosts to smack, it's still got the satisfaction of hitting things, but I would argue that Simon's Quest does it better out of the two. And of course, you can't forget about the weird stiff jumping mechanics everybody loves. So yeah, the controls are basically the same. You have the same strut in your walk, the same delay in your whip, the same objective, which is to kill Dracula. The main goal of the game is to possess all five parts of Dracula that are hidden all throughout the world. Well, I guess possess if you want to get technical. Each body part is located inside a mansion, and the only way to find these is to explore around and ask for cryptic advice from NPCs. First thing to do in this town is to buy a white crystal. Okay, easy enough. A symbol of evil will appear, uh, a, a pear, when you strike the stake? Hit to bore a cliff with your head to make a hole? What? The dead river waits to be freed from the curse. Um, garlic in the graveyard summons a stranger. Huh. Okay, well, oh my gosh, how'd you get here? The first one to two hours of the game was just me walking around having no clue on what to do. 
the NPCs were no help, so I finally just said, screw it, I'm looking up a walkthrough. This is the biggest downfall of the game. Some parts are just insanely cryptic, and without a walkthrough or the original Nintendo Power issue, you're not gonna get anywhere. It takes the fun out of the game when you have to look up a walkthrough just to progress in the game. They could've easily fixed this issue if they didn't have stupid riddles and cryptic advice. Just tell us straight up. You wanna know what hit Deborah Cliff with your head to make a hole really means? Select the red crystal, duck down, and wait for a tornado to take you to the next mansion. Great advice, game. Honestly, I wouldn't blame anyone for looking up a walkthrough for this, because it's so confusing on what to do, it probably would have taken me over a week just to make it to the third mansion. <sighs> okay. So this game adds RPG elements into the mix. While you're exploring, you'll find towns that have NPCs that will sell you certain items. A lot of these items you'll recognize from the first game, but it also has a handful of new ones to try out. You can also buy different whips to upgrade your damage, ranging from the standard leather whip, to a chain whip, to even a flame whip. The currency in the game is hearts, which are found only by killing enemies. This is when a certain mechanic called grinding comes into play. If a certain item you want costs a lot of hearts, you're going to be whipping zombies for a long time. But it gets worse, because when you die and run out of lives, you lose all your hearts, so you want to be safe and find a place you feel comfortable with so you won't die and waste all that time you just spent grinding just to buy some holy water. Now, to be honest, I didn't really have a big issue with this, which is surprising considering I hate grinding in other RPGs, but the satisfaction of killing something in this game feels amazing, so I didn't really mind. I get why Konami did this, they obviously did it to make the game longer than the original, but this is just lazy. Same with the cryptic advice, it's just bad game design, and like I said, lazy on their part. Another main feature in this game is the day and night cycle. You know, the big black box that pops out of nowhere and interrupts the- ...and interrupts the game constantly. I know this is a big complaint by many, including mine, but this was revolutionary at the time. You never saw a day and night cycle on the NES. It was a cool concept, just not executed well. The first complaint about this is the time it takes to switch over from day to night or night to day. The game's text is slow in general, and after that's done, it takes a bit to switch in between times. At first, I didn't have an issue with it. It kind of just happened whenever, and I didn't really care, but after a while, it gets really annoying. At night time, the monsters get stronger and harder to kill, so if you're on your way to a town to buy something or regain your health, it can get stressful at times. Also in the towns, all the shops and houses are closed at night, so you'll have to wait until morning to buy something or talk to anyone, which involves more waiting, thus making the game longer. One thing I will say about this feature though is that it adds a feeling of fear that the original never had. Ultimately, the game feels scarier compared to the original. The game is dark. Not just evil dark, but literally dark. The environments go for a darker tone, the enemies seem more serious looking. The day and night cycle adds a sense of oh crap whenever night hits, especially if you have a full wallet of hearts. The story feels more serious, instead of oh it just feel like killing Dracula. Belmont must kill Dracula in order to stay alive. Now I want to talk a little more in depth about the mansions, because they're a pretty important part of the game. Each mansion is filled with enemies, spikes, fake blocks, and annoying platforming sections. They're usually pretty linear, but sometimes they'll have fake walls to throw you off track. I never really had a tough time with them. The only things that gave me hassles were the dumb fake blocks and the annoying platforming sections. And, and now that I think about it, really nothing in this game has given me a hassle aside from the cryptic puzzles. They really took a step back in the difficulty department. I'm guessing they got complaints from the original, so they toned down the difficulty for less skilled players. Whenever you die, you respawn right where you left off. Same with continues, the game puts you right back wherever you died. So there's really no punishment to dying other than to lose all your hearts. I found myself just plowing through certain sections and taking hits not caring about the consequences because half the time I already bought the item I wanted. But that's not all they toned down, they even toned down the boss's difficulty and there's only like three of them counting the final boss. You would expect them to have a boss after every mansion, but that only happened like twice. Most of the time you just threw an oak stake at a flashing orb. Yeah, yeah, I don't get this game. Remember how much concentration you had when fighting the Grim Reaper in Castlevania 1? Or how much frustration you had against Frankenstein? Or what about the satisfaction of beating Dracula? Well, this game throws all that out the frickin' window. 
The bosses are pathetic. They're easy. They take no effort. And going back to the point on the consequences of dying, you can take as many hits and as many tries as you want to kill these guys. Not that you'll need more tries because they're so easy. But by far the most disappointing thing is the final battle, the finale, the ending of the game. It's underwhelming. Not only is Dracula one of the easiest bosses I've ever fought, but he's probably the most unsatisfying boss to ever kill. Most people use the sacred flame method of killing him, but I didn't have that. So I used this method of throwing this dagger in the corner and killing him in like four hits. And honestly, I said to myself, that's it? I was shocked to see a final boss take such little amount of effort. And just like that, I beat Castlevania 2 Simon's quest. And it sure was a quest, all right. Overall, if I could sum up the game to just one word, it would be lazy. The cryptic puzzle design, the grinding parts of the game, the mansions, the bosses, the final boss, everything just seemed lazy. Konami just tried the easy way to make a game longer and it turned out just being a badly designed game. And it's a shame, the concept is cool, it paved the way for the future of the franchise. The next game that would be inspired by this one is Sympathy of the Night, arguably the fan favorite of the franchise. But I also gotta give this game props. The atmosphere of the game was more serious and darker, the music had some better tracks compared to the original, in my opinion, and Konami tried something new. It was fresh, it was a good idea, just not executed well. It was truly the experimented sequel of Castlevania. We wouldn't see the next entry in the Castlevania series until another year later with the release of Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse. And this is when they learned from their mistakes and went back to the original linear level design from the first one. So tune in next week in this Castlevania Marathon where I'll be taking a look at Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse.